the first thing I want to do real quickly is I want to talk about um, the Emerald Tablet because the, the Book of Hermes or the Book of Health or the Hermetic Tablet, uh, which there is actually one that has been translated by um, uh, Sir Isaac Newton, which is actually in the Cambridge Library in, in England. Um, a lot of people seem to, well, you know, these tablets, I mean, do they ever exist? What's the credibility of them? I just want to give you a brief summary, a little bit about these tablets and how these Hermetic Principles really originated. Not only did the Hermetic Principles originate from this gentleman named Thoth, uh, and I don't call him a god or a deity. He's a person just like me and you, uh, just much more spiritually advanced and technologically advanced as well. Um, but these, these, um, these tablets, they, they break down these principles, which we're going to get into shortly, but also a lot of religions around the world, many different religions, took from these Hermetic principles and created their system from it. Um, you know, so they, they found a way to capture it, some of the essence of it, and turn it into a control system when it was really meant to be a system of freedom, to take the bondage away, unshackle people, unshackle your mind, and, and take yourself to the next level, even the next dimension. So I'm gonna read a little bit from, from this. Uh, this is actually in the book and also in the Emerald Tablets. The history of the Emerald Tablets is very strong and well-documented. The original text is written in those Atlantic, Atlantean language. The version that I'll be referencing in this workshop is translated by Dr. Michael Doriel and can be found on crystallinks.com. A new translation has been recently published from the Arabic version of the Emerald Tablet and is called the Book of Causes, written by the famous Thomas Aquinas. So Thomas Aquinas, uh, was inspired by these uh, animal tablets, just like I was, to write a book. And his book is called um, The Book of Causes. Very good book. You should check it out. A translation by Sir Isaac Newton was found among his alcohol chemical papers, currently housed in King's College Library at Cambridge University. Philip of Tripoli also translated the animal tablets in 1240 AD. Also a famous version called The Book of the Secret of Creation and the Art of Nature was written by him in 683 AD. So this goes way back, guys. He was also inspired by the Emerald Tablet to write a book as well. These are very famous people. These aren't people that you would just say, oh, you know, this average person that's just walking around the street. And these are people, real scholars, real scholarly affluent people. A famous author named Roger Bacon was accepted into Oxford University at the age of 13, also translated and wrote a version of the Emerald Tablets. He was an English philosopher and Franciscan friar who placed considerable emphasis on the study of nature through empirical methods. In the early modern era, he was regarded as a wizard and partly famed for his story of the mechanical necromatic brazen head that he built. He is sometimes credited uh, since the 19th century as one of the earliest European advocates of the modern scientific method and was inspired by Aristotle and later scholars, such as Arab scientist al Hazen. So we're talking about, you know, these are really <laughs> important people in history that have uh, accessed this information and was inspired to make and create works about them. So just to let you know, this is, this is you know, real deep stuff. And this all goes back to, you probably heard me talk about before, the Anunnaki. The Anunnaki are the Atlanteans. Anunnaki is a generalized term. People tend to think Anunnaki means one specific race of people or beings. But Anunnaki is a generalized term for what a lot of the ancients talk about. If you go to every single religion around the planet, every single civilization around the planet, outside of even religion. As far back as you go, from cave paintings to, 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 to baked stone tablets, to cylinder scrolls, uh, to scriptures written on papyrus, everywhere you look around this entire planet, and trust me, I've been around this entire planet, you can see my pictures that I post all the time, there's always evidence of beings coming from another place to here to work, teach, and engage mankind. And these are the Anunnaki. There are many different races from many different pla places, many different planets. Not just one place, not just one planet, many different places. The thing is, is we look like them. We're the new kids on the block. Human beings on this planet are fairly new. The homo sapiens sapiens, I should say, are fairly new. But let me just give you a breakdown of why I got into the, how I got into the Hermetic Principles is when I first started looking into the animal tablets and reading them. And these first opening passages here just blew me away. Let me read this. We have evidence of a great flood. Over the world then broke the great waters, drowning and sinking, changing Earth's balance, until only the Temple of Light was left. Standing on the great mountain of Gundal, still rising out of the water, some there were too living, saved from the rush of the fountains. So here we have evidence of an ancient flood, a global flood, written in the Amber Tablet uh, 36,000 years ago. Then he says, call to me the master saying, gather ye together my people, take them by the arts ye have learned far across the waters 
until ye reach the land of the hairy barbarians, dwelling in the caves of the desert. Follow there the plan that ye know of. So right here, his, his thought me or his daddy, really his Enki, is telling him he needs to get the people together that he's trained and worked with and they have a mission and a goal to go across to where there's this area where the hairy barbarians live and help raise them back to a higher level of civilization. So he says, gathered by then my people entered into the great ship of the master. Upward we rose into the morning. This is where it got me right away. When I said upward we rose, I knew he wasn't getting on a boat that sailed out into the ocean. He went on onto a, a ship that went up into the sky. Darkness beneath us laid a temple. Suddenly over it rose the waters, vanished from earth. So now they've left the atmosphere. So they've literally gotten into a ship and gone out into space. Until the time appointed was the great temple. So now they've got to their coordinates and they've located where their landing spot's gonna be. He says, fast we fled uh, toward the sun of the morning until beneath us lay the land of the children of Kem. Now the children of Kem, this is where we get into where alchemy and chemistry come from. It comes from the land of Kem. Where's the land of Kem? The land of Kem is actually ancient Egypt before it was called Egypt. Egypt is a fairly new name. The name of that area was called the land of Kem back in deep antiquity. And that's where he went to help re restart civilization. Civilization actually initially, if you go into other tablets, you discover that civilization started in Iraq and Mesopotamia. Later on after the great flood, because of the destruction that happened there, they moved all main base operations over to Egypt. I guess it was uh, apparently uh, seemed maybe a much easier place to redevelop and kickstart. Maybe there were more survivors in that area. Uh, so basically, he, say, he goes on to say that, um, fast, so he, they say, can we land the camp? So raging, they came with cultures and spears. So now he's, he's landing in this ship, and he opens the door, and these uh, barbarians come to attack, seeking to slay and utterly destroy the sons of Atlantis. So he goes, I raised my staff and directed a ray of vibration, striking them still in their tracks as fragments of stone of the mountain. So now here we have more evidence of technology. He's got a stun ray back in ancient times, that actually stuns these people and stops them from attacking. And I talk about this in the book because there's something we call, we have now called the active denial system in the US military. And this active denial system uses a ray beam to an invisible ray beam to send out a crowd of attackers or riders and get them to stop in their tracks and turn and flee the other way. So this, this is the things that I cover when I, when I call it a companion because I'm breaking down the information for you. Long dwelt we in the land of Kim, long and yet long again until obeying the commands of the master who while sleeping yet lives eternally. And this, this is where it gets into the, the halls of Amenti where they have these avatar bodies underneath the Great Pyramid, which I talked about in the book that they've discovered hundreds of, uh, of uh, rooms underneath the Great Pyramid that extend about a mile out underneath the sand of Giza. And in these rooms, they had these halls of Amenti's where they would put their avatar bodies in and they would walk amongst men, but unlike men. So they would be in these avatar bodies, transferring their consciousness into other bodies, walking around, bodies that they made themselves, their own clones, they says in here in, in the actual tablets, they created their own body. So they've obviously taken, uh, we can do that nowadays. We can take a stem cell from a person, put it into a laboratory condition, trigger it, and then, then create a complete clone of a person. And if you have enough storage space, which we now have, which we'll go over a little bit later, you can transfer your consciousness directly into that avatar body and you can walk. And while that body's walking, they would have another body sleeping inside of these chambers. And that sleeping body would be regenerating so they didn't have to make too many bodies all the time. They would regenerate one body and walk around in another. Amazing stuff. But ironically, we're doing that today with the 2045 project out of Russia and also the DARPA project out of America where we have the, uh, the Avatar project where we have soldiers in underground bunkers transferring their consciousness into field robots uh, so that they have a symbiotic relationship and the consciousness of the, consciousness of the soldier controls the field robot and that way, if the field robots killed or assassinated or whatever, destroyed, the soldier's still alive. So this is stuff that we're doing right now today. Look that up. That's real. That's what I cover in the book. This is real um, released information, declassified information that you can look up and, and find out. So what Thoth is saying 36,000 years ago, we're doing and duplicating right now today. Another important thing I want to talk about, because we have to establish how powerful and how knowledgeable these people were before I get into the principles, because I want you to know that this isn't just something that some, some philosopher just sat back and said, it would sound cool to talk about this stuff. I want you to know how advanced these people were. In the Emerald Tablet, Thoth says, I built the Great Pyramid, pattern after the Pyramid of Earth's force, burning eternally so that it too might remain through the ages. 
In it, I build up my knowledge of magic science. That's, that translates into advanced technology. So that I might be, so that it might be here when I return from a menti. I, while I sleep in the halls of a menti, my soul roaming free will incarnate well amongst men in this form or another. Hermes thrice born. You see, it's what I was talking about in having these avatar bodies. And when you look at the history of Thoth the Atlantean, you discover that he uh, was many names over many eons. He's been Mercury, he's been uh, Odin, of course, Thoth, uh, Quetzalcoatl to, to the, the uh, Mesoamericans. Uh, he's been Veracocha, Kukulkan, um, Dehudi, Tehudi in Africa. Um, I mean, I could just go on and on. The names are just immense. We're talking about over thousands of years and different looks that he's had as well. He's always depicted with a beak, a bird's beak, but he doesn't look like a bird at all. He doesn't look like a bird. He doesn't have feathers. They gave him an ibis beak because it depicts something very important. An ibis bird has to put its feet deep into the mud to get sustenance. So it goes deep into the darkness to bring darkness to light so that they can, so that they can survive and eat. So what, he, what, it, the, the, what it's saying is, is that Thoth himself, he always goes into darkness. And when you read the animal tablets, you discover this. He goes to places where mankind has fallen to a low level and helps bring them back to a high level. So he, he goes in deep to bring things back up. He goes into darkness to bring darkness to light. That's the symbolism of the ibis bird beak that you see on Thoth the Atlantean. It has nothing to do with him looking like a bird. He's not a bird. He's not a blue bird with feathers at all. He's actually a person. As a matter of fact, the original face of the Sphinx, which a lot of mainstream scientists are trying to say used to be a lion's face, it was never a lion's face. When you go into the Sumerian tablets, you discover it was actually his original face. But then much later, the face was recarved down to Marduk, who was also known as Amen Ra, which is his brother. His brother took it and recarved it down to his son's face. So it's really his son's, I mean, it's really Thoth's nephew's face on the Sphinx now, which is why it's importunate to the body size. And, but still, regardless, you can see what the people look like. Look at the face of the Sphinx, and I will tell you what they look like. 